Hello, and welcome to the Collider.com podcast. I'm Collider.com senior editor Matt Goldberg, and with me is managing editor Adam Chitwood. Howdy, folks. We asked what y'all wanted us to talk about, and y'all chose Back to the Future. So Back to the Future, which is currently streaming on Netflix along with its sequels, we will be talking about all three films, but focusing primarily on the first one. We'll talk about why it works so well, uh, talk about you know people constantly want to reboot it or remake it, or we'll talk about why that's a bad idea. And also, it's not going to happen as long as the creators of it are still alive, because they don't want it to happen. Um, so we'll talk about about uh, Back to the Future uh, sequels, and then we'll move on to Recently Watched. So Back to the Future is one of my all-time favorite movies. It is a movie I can watch anytime. I, it's, I love it to death. And what what strikes me about it is that the screenplay is really tight as a drum. Like, it's a very weird movie when you, like, start to explain things about it. Like, John Mulaney has a really good bit about, like, pitching Back to the Future and how weird it sounds. Like, his best friend is a disgraced old scientist. <laughs> like, that's a weird thing. And it's like, oh, he's going to go back in time and, like, meet his parents. Oh, that's interesting. Also, he's going to go on a date with his mom, and his mom's almost going to get raped by the school bully. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, it's a weird film when you describe things that happen in Back to the Future. But from a screenplay perspective, if you look at, like, story structure and set up and payoff, it is immaculate. Like it is a screenplay to be studied for all of the sort of, you know, guns that go off up, you know, over the course of the film. And like, how do we, you know, it, and it's not that the time travel of back to the future is complicated. This isn't primer, but it's the more, it's more the aspect of like, where did, if you need plutonium, where did doc Brown get plutonium? And like, if you need, you know, the clock tower to be struck at a certain time, how is Marty going to know what time the clock tower is going to be struck by lightning? And how do you drop in all of this information in a way that's organic? And how do you make these scenes work in a way that feels natural to the story? So when you have Lorraine telling about how she and George met, that's a lot of exposition, but it all is necessary to not just illustrating the conflict that Marty's going to have later in the film, but it also tells you about Marty's home life and what his relationship to his parents are like. And, you know, his parents, we're seeing them as old people. We're going to see them as young people who haven't had their dreams crushed. <laughs> <laughs> it's again, it's a weird movie. That's one of the reasons I love it. It's a strange film when you look at it, but it's from a structural standpoint, if, as a screenplay, just the first just the opening credits gives you so much information about the world you're about to enter, and it does so effortlessly. It never looks like it's straining to give its audience information. No, the economy of storytelling is is uh, brilliant in this movie in, in terms of being able to very clearly and quickly relay information in a way that doesn't feel contrived. Like you said, you have to explain how a time machine works. You have to explain how time travel works. You have to explain why there's a ticking clock, um, you know, why it's so important for, I almost said Morty, Marty, uh, to, <laughs> um, which the trivia nugget Rick and Morty started as just a very grotesque uh, uh, Back to the Future parody cartoon. Uh, I think you can find the original online somewhere. Um, but it was just like a really R-rated version of the Doc and, and Marty relationship. Um, but yeah, it relays all that information incredibly well. Um, and I think even, you know, I think a lot of it, I think I agree with you. I think the script is airtight. The script is perfect. But I also think Zemeckis' direction is impeccable. Um, you talk about the opening credits, you know, relaying so much information, but even that opening scene. So Marty, you know, turns the volume all the way up on the speaker and he strums the guitar thing and he's thrown back and like everything in the room explodes back, which just like kind of subtly tells you that this movie is not supposed to be insanely realistic. Like it's a little elevated. Everything is just a little bit uh, kind of winking and like in on the joke, which I think is is what allows you to take some of those uh, logic leaps later on in the film. You're not you're not questioning too hard, like why uh, Doc was so easily able to get the plutonium and like why the Libyans are around and all of like you said, it's a strange film. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, but I think, again, the economy of storytelling, the way in which information is relayed is pretty brilliant. Um and maybe that's due to the fact that they shot the movie like 
twice because they had cast Eric Stoltz as Marty McFly and shot like at least half the movie, I think, right? Before Eric Stoltz was fired. It was a it was a it was a big deal to recast Eric Stoltz. Yeah. So it was in the middle of I mean, they if you don't know the original story is that they went to Michael J. Fox. He was busy shooting family ties, so he was unavailable. So they cast Eric Stoltz. About halfway through shooting the movie with Eric Stoltz, Zemeckis was like, it's not working. I can't do it. Um, and they recast him. And they cast him with Michael J. Fox. Because Michael J. Fox was still shooting Family Ties, he was on this insane schedule where he just wasn't sleeping because he was doing Family Ties during the day. And then he'd have to switch back over and do Back to the Future in the afternoon at night and get back up and do Family Ties. And on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, he would do Back to the Future all weekend um, just to get that down. And I do wonder if that repetition w- allowed Zemeckis to kind of hone some stuff in um, because it's just perfect. Like the, the way that the story unfolds is, is impeccable. Well, and it has all, like you were saying, sort of this sort of, it's a slightly elevated reality. It sort of, it knows when to be grounded in terms of like, this is the 50s as we generally understand it. Kind of this idyll now now to be fair, a very idyllic white mm-hmm. white 50s. Um, and we'll get into, I want to get into the racial stuff later of Back to the yeah. Future. I think that's worth talking about. But it's still like, oh, your parents in the 50s. Okay, I get, like, that's like, the universality of it. But the film knows when it's being a little off kilter. Like everything with Doc is pretty much a little off kilter. Yeah. Um, you know, he's like, I, you build a time machine out of a DeLorean. <laughs> Although what's interesting, the time machine was originally supposed to be a refrigerator, which is just, it's so weird to think about that because it has no, it's not visually, it doesn't grab you anyway. It doesn't do yeah. uh, The re- I think the reason they changed it is because they didn't want kids climbing into refrigerators, which is also a good thing. <laughs> That's um, fair. But, you know, there's just those little details, like the fact when you hit 88 miles per hour, uh, the little flame trails come out of the car. That's a really cool thing. Like, it's just those nice little details along the way that help give this world, make this world feel distinctive. Uh, even if the common, the not the common, but the core concept of the film is, and what the, what the screenwriters have always said, I think Bob Gale has always said, we, this film is like, what if you could go back in time and meet your parents when they were teenagers? Like, what would that be like? And when you have that emotional core, everything else, I don't want to say it falls into place, but you have a very good core concept of what your movie is supposed to be. Like, the whole film is not really about Marty solving time travel. They solved the time travel problem in, like, 10 minutes. Like, yeah. he, less than 10 minutes. He's like, like, I don't know how to get you back. I need a bolt of lightning. Oh, here's a bolt of lightning. Oh, great. Well, I mean, like that, everything's great. And Marty's like, I'll hang out. And Doc's like, you can't leave the house. He's like, well, I have some bad news. <laughs> the conflict of the film. The conflict of the film is not how do we travel through time. That's the plot of Back to the Future Part 3. <laughs> that, that large part of Back to the Future Part 3 is how do we get the time travel working. This is simply how do I make sure that I get to exist? Yeah. Which is, I, I think it's so smart because I think, again, I think you're right. I think it's that core idea, that core emotional idea of what were your parents like in high school that's so smart. And again, this movie is so much set up and payoff on this recent rewatch. And I've seen this movie more times than I can count. Uh, I was obsessed with it when I was a kid. But I was thinking a lot about the films of Edgar Wright and how Edgar Wright's films are all structured around set up and payoff, especially Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, where the first half of the film is like, uh, the second half of the film is the reflected version of the first half of the film, um, and it kind of follows the sequence of events. But if you think about you know, the beginning of Back to the Future, when you open up in 1985 and the parents are talking, um, you know, Marty's dad is kind of a wimp. He can't deal with Biff. His mom is talking about how, you know, don't ever trust a girl that's calling a boy and his mom is drinking and she's unhappy. So it's giving you all this information, even though you don't know that you're getting that information so that when you get back in time, when he runs into them in 1955, um, it's just a total like, wait, what? Um, Because his mom is just mad horny, like crazy horny (laughs) for, (laughs) for her son. (laughs) <laughs> which is the thing that happens um and his dad it's a is a weird movie people it's a very <laughs> weird movie which is i mean it's not untruthful about you know teenagers in high school but again it's that contrast between what you just saw at the beginning of the film in 1985 uh where you know um 
she's you know disapproving of Jennifer and disapproving of of Marty's relationship with her. Um, but then also kind of seeing what his dad's life was like, and his dad is just this massive nerd. And Crispin Glover, I think, is really great in this film um, uh, and gives a, a really kind of iconic performance. But the actor that I kept going back to was Thomas F. Wilson, who plays Biff, yeah. um, especially throughout the trilogy, because he has to play so many different characters or different versions of the same lineage. Um, and they're all very different. I, I just think he does a, a really tremendous job. Yeah, to me, Biff is the quintessential bully. Like when I think of a bully, I think of Biff Tannen and that's just who he is. And it makes him a very simple antagonist. And something I do like about these films is that they know to keep it simple. There's never really a point in any of these movies where it's like, no one has ever said of Back to the Future, this is too difficult to follow. Yeah. <laughs> no one has ever said that. These are, this character doesn't track. Like it's very easy. And it is, it's, it's sort of like, you know, Marty is this one kid and like Biff is the bully and like Biff is, always this bully that recurs in Marty's life as this sort of basic antagonist. But I think Thomas F. Wilson really gives him a lot of, gives him a lot of personality. Like it's, it's not just, he's the bad guy. He is someone that you actively dislike and yet he's kind of captivating. Yeah. He's super captivating. He's super compelling. He's not, uh, you know, he's not one note for as kind of exaggerated and cartoony as this franchise can get, um, I think the characters are all really solid, and I think the, that's uh, due in large part to the performances there, um, but also kind of the writing and the direction. I think Leah Thompson is also incredible in this film. Um, again, Matt Horney, but also, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of lonely. Uh, you know, she's uh, got a bunch of siblings, and it's just interesting watching her around school. And I think that core nugget of an idea to go back to that of – uh, what were your parents like in high school is just something that everyone can relate to. Um, and so I think this film examining that, I think it's just so smart. And I think it's, it, there's a big reason why it's a film that resonates so strongly with kids and with teens um, because it is so effortlessly relatable. Well, and I also think the way it does a generational divide is also yeah. very clever. The fact of going from eighties to the fifties is very, a very clever kind of mirroring because you know, the idea of the Reagan era is to evoke this sort of imagined 1950s past. I mean, the notion of make America great again, that's not a Trump stole that line from Reagan, who was then talking about, you know, the 1950s when he was an actor. And, you know, and that also, again, set up in payoff where Ronald Reagan is, you know, you see when Marty goes back to 55 you see Ronald Reagan's name on the marquee of the movie theater. And then later Doc is like Ronald Reagan, the actor, like this notion of how things have changed so dramatically. Something that I also, I'm kind of curious to get your thought on this. I personally feel like back to the future. I kind of go back and forth. Like, I think there are some eighties movies that are very much like pro Reagan era, Reagan revolution. They're very much of that. age. Like I think a film like top gun, which is very like pro military and pro like, uh, you know, the military might and isn't like the U S fucking awesome. Um, and even like a film like ghostbusters, which looks like kind of irreverent, but like, you'll have this line where like Bill Murray's like, no one steps on a church in my town. And also like the EPA is the bad guy. Like it's, a weird, <laughs> you know, but back to the future, I, I mean, which came out in, in 1985. Um, I feel like it's a film that's a little bit of an indictment of the Reagan era because Marty lives in a shithole. <laughs> <laughs> like Hill Valley is not like Hill Valley is not great. Um, the theater that he traveled like in the present day in 85 is a porno house. Like a lot of the businesses are run down. There's graffiti on a uh, lion estates where he lives. Uh, it's not until he goes back to 55 where everything is shiny and new and like actually good. But if you came, if you looked at it in 85, it kind of looks like it's not Biff hell world of part two. But it's also not, like, fantastic either. Like, he doesn't, like, live in, like, a good – like, it's not like everything is awesome in Marty's life. Um, so I felt like that was, you know, a bit of an indictment there. But I also want to talk about the Goldie Wilson of it all. So but before we get to that <laughs> – I, Well, we've lost – by the way, we've lost all our viewers at this point. <laughs> no, no one heard about – are they, are they talking about Back to the Future and – 
politics. <laughs> uh... Well, I did. It that did strike me because I haven't like sat down to watch Back to the Future like consciously start to finish in a little while. Um, I mean, it's I put it on a lot. It's always on like in the background and stuff. Um, but I actually found the ending of it to be interesting and such a product of the 1980s consumerism because uh, Marty goes back in time and he makes things better. And the epitome of things being better is that he has a shiny, fancy new truck. His house is very clean and white and like cocaine-y. Um, and like his sister is going on a bunch of dates and his brother is a businessman and his dad is a successful author like the like success in this world is materialism is like no that's a good point like yeah the metrics of success it's not just like he came back and everything was the same but his parents are happier together yeah it's like they're thinner and we all have great (laughs) jobs exactly which is fine i mean i think that's what this movie the again i like this movie is not supposed to be 100 percent realistic so it's a little bit exaggerated but i think that's perfectly fitting for 1985 for like what what defines success in 1985 is exactly the kind of life that marty's living at the end of the movie so i've seen people kind of poo-poo it and say like still defines it now (laughs) yeah well, I've seen people try and be like, oh, you know, the ending of Back to the Future is just so materialistic and so whatever. But like that was 1985. Yeah. Like that, that was 1985. What do you expect? Yeah. And that um, was what that was what the world was selling you as success. And so uh, for a film that is dealing with very simple versions of things, like you said, it's a very simple version of 1955. Like it's yeah, the, yeah. the idyllic version. It's not trying to be like, OK, what was Hill Valley? actually like in 1955 and then when we get we'll talk about it later but like in the sequels like the future is a very like exaggerated version of what the sequel of what the future would look like an exaggerated version of what the wild west looks like so i don't think zemeckis is has any pretense that he's you know trying to be predictive or um hyper realistic so i don't think it's an indictment of the film to say that 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 the ending is success equals materialism I would also say I don't think the film is like an indictment that like, oh, like Hill Valley is bad in 1985 because they have a black mayor. Like, I think the film is basically saying all politicians are the same because the mayor, the mayoral slogan of whoever the mayor is in 1955 is the exact slogan that Goldie Wilson uses in 1985. Now, the idea is that all politicians are the same and that they don't matter, Um, which I think is cynical in its own way. But I don't think it's like Hill Valley was great until they elected a black mayor. I don't think that's what the film is saying. Um, I do kind of want to get into something that is kind of a flashpoint of controversy, as much as this film has ever been a flashpoint of controversy. I was surprised the other week when they're like, why don't they recognize Marty? Like, like I, I, that I don't care about. Um, no. But some people have argued like, oh, Marty is, you know, claiming to invent like Chuck Berry, like he's stealing Chuck Berry's music and giving Chuck Berry the idea, like, so a white guy invented Chuck Berry's music. And I've never, that critique doesn't wash with me. That doesn't make any sense because Marty knows it's a Chuck Berry song. He knows, <laughs> he knows it. He says, he says, you guys aren't ready for this yet, but your kids are going to love it. He never, he, he knows the song backwards and forwards. If not, at no point does he ever claim this is my music because the music that he plays in the band audition is totally different. And it's more in line with like Van Halen and like the kind of music that he listens to. So Chuck Berry still invented Chuck Berry's music. He's just having listening to someone else play it for him. That's why it's like that new sound you're looking for. It's you. (laughs) (laughs) It's you. It's a a weird time paradox, but it's you. Yeah. So that's always kind of gotten under my nerves. Like, ah, how could Marty, you know, I think there are other race, racial elements. Like I don't feel like in back to the future part two, where his boss is a Japanese guy and goes McFry. I don't yeah. think that's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, I also feel like there there are areas where Back to the Future is worthy of critique and others where I feel like the text doesn't support that reading. No, no. And I think I think you're right on the Chuck Berry thing. I don't I that that critique doesn't really hold a lot of water to me as well. Um, I mean, I don't know. I It feels 
it, it's kind of funny that the movie is this old and people are still trying to kind of poke holes in it and try to find like plot holes or like inconsistencies. Well, you, gotta you gotta get those clicks, man. You gotta yeah. find that weird thing that no one has talked about in the 35 year history of Back to the Future. But it either doesn't make sense or doesn't matter. Like, yeah, just like, exactly. Like you, you have to kind of like that's that's sort of one of the problems about when you kind of if you want to drill down into this one thing, it can be kind of an entertaining or humorous read, but you're not looking at the totality of the movie. Yeah, well, kind of like that the whole Avengers Endgame thing where uh, you know they were like, well, in actuality, time travel does not work the way it does in Back to the Future. It's like okay, but it was a story contrivance, like it was a story device yeah. um, that was made for the film that makes it makes sense like a right. flux capacitor like, doesn't like if you want to talk about like plot holes and stuff like i when watching back to the future 2 like i don't think back to the future 2 is as tight a film as the first one. no back to the future 2 like if you want to talk, if we can move into that film now yeah um i was re-watching that one now first off back to the future 2 what's interesting about it is that it's kind of the first act is is constrained because the first movie ends and it's like we have to go to the future <laughs> So no matter what happens, like they, you have to start that movie going to the future. But the 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 meat of the film is, you know, we we screwed up. It's a three act structure of, you know, the future, the alternate eighty five, and then nineteen fifty five again. Mm-hmm. But and it, I think it's a good structure. But something that jumped out at me that I never realized before. So in Back to the Future Part Two, the past is changed because Biff got in the time machine and changed the past. How would Biff know how to work the time machine? <laughs> like, well, how would you know? like, get it up to 88 miles per hour? How would you know yeah. that? Uh, he wouldn't, but I don't think it, it that's one of those things. Yeah, where... because like, huh, Biff doesn't know how to work the time machine, but whatever. There but... are, well, and so one of the things that I think makes Back to the Future, the first movie so great is that it's continually setting up like, um, also when Marty first goes to Doc, he's like, all right, you have to stay here. You can't see anyone. It's like, oh, no, I've already seen my mom and my dad. And it's like, whoa, like that's already been blown away. It's like, all right, well, you have to get them back together. And it's like, oh, no, I actually became the person that my dad was supposed to be. So it's continually the movie is telling you this cannot happen. Whatever you do, don't do this thing. And it happens. And so what makes it interesting is seeing that it's happened and then trying to find a way out of it. Whereas a lot of other films will set up an obstacle and the hero kind of has to get around it or whatever. This one, it's like, Oh, well that one's already blown. Like we already did. Like I did the thing I wasn't supposed to do. So how do I find a way out of it? I think back to the future part two struggles because it's more can, it gets more convoluted because it's dealing with the, the, the separate timeline. So it's not as clear cut in terms of the rules of like, you cannot do this thing or else this will happen. Um, And then kind of snowballing from there. Um, And like Back to the Future Part 2 is probably, I would probably say it's the movie that I've seen the most in my entire life. As a kid, I was obsessed with it. But I I had like five or six VHSs that I just watched over and over again. And that was one of them. Um, But I do remember distinctively, like I would sometimes kind of stop watching or tune out after the future stuff was over because I was just really drawn to that future world and what Zemeckis had built up. And I was reading an uh, an old interview with Zemeckis and Bob Gale, who were the screenplay where they were talking about like they knew full well we would not have flying cars in 2015. But it was cinematic. They were like, we have to have flying cars. It's cool. Right. It's fun. So that's that's that whole um, aspect of that film. But I think because it is trying to tackle, as you said, those three separate timelines, it gets a little bit convoluted. And to me, on this recent rewatch, like it's pretty cartoony. Like oh, the, the very f- cartoony. Yeah, like the first film doesn't take place in reality. It, it kind of lets you know that, but it's still fairly grounded. But this one. The in terms of like the one liners and the jokes, they get kind of Looney Tunes ish. Yeah. Which I think is fine. I think, you know, the fact that part two feels kind of exaggerated, it makes me feel like I'm watching a new story. Like to yeah. me, the the future stuff, I need it to be cartoony because plot wise, it's the beat it, it is consciously repeating beats from the first film. Mm-hmm. To the point where Biff says, This all feels very familiar. Yeah. Like it is consciously doing those things. <clears throat> Whereas, like, I the film pulls me in more once they go to alternate 85, and then especially in 1955, where they're trying to dodge themselves. That's my favorite part of the film, is 1955, because the film has folded in on itself, and I really like that. 
I mean, it's just really fun to kind of see events that you would seen play out in the first movie playing out in a different way. Um, and another thing I found interesting when reading up on research was in the sequel, they couldn't make a deal with Crispin Glover because he wanted too much money to come back. And so they like used makeup to make someone look like Crispin Glover. And this movie directly led to like laws that were put in place that said you could not use someone's likeness to, make, to essentially just make it look like they were there, even though they right. weren't there. Which I thought was funny. That is funny. Uh, but I still really like Back to the Future Part 2. Uh, to me, it's, it's, it's as watchable as the first one. Even though I think the first one is a stronger film overall. Mm-hmm. I can always chill out with Back to the Future Part 2. I think it's a really fun movie. Yeah. Um, the one I get hung up on is Part 3. Part 3 is a weird... I, like, I think because Part 3 is not... it's Part 3 is just so different. That's the thing mm-hmm. about Part 3. Part 3 is so different from the first two in so many ways. It's not really Marty's story, it's Doc's story. It's set in the Old West, uh, which is, and so it becomes kind of a Western of what had previously been like a sci-fi adventure series. But, and then it all revolves around how, to, like the main thrust of the plot is trying to get the, the car up to 88. And like, there's kind of like a heist element, but also like, you know, in terms of like, how are they planning to pull this off? And then there's a love story with Doc, and then there's also, like, what is Marty up to? It's a weird kind of movie. I don't think it's a bad film. Like, I would not say, like, Back to the Future Part Three is bad. I just, it's it's odd. When you put it next to the first two, it's an odd film. So, I had always contended that it was the worst of the three. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I saw that Ben Schwartz, like, kind of started up a controversy where he tweeted recently that Back to the Future Part Three was better than Part Two, and I was like, he's this guy's crazy. Um, and then I watched Part Three, which again, I had not seen from front to back in a long time. And it's really good. <laughs> I yeah. liked it a lot. I like it. I like that it's different. I like that it grounds Doc. And it, it, maybe it's because part two is so out there and so um, cartoony that the groundedness and kind of the slower pace of part three is something that I really enjoyed. It still mimics some of the, st- some of the um, events that happened in the first two films. But it's much more a love story between Doc and Clara and considering like, so this is the conclusion to the trilogy. And we know that Marty has his whole life ahead of him because he's a teenager. What happens to the guy who invented time travel? Like, what is his ultimate goal in life Um, and what might bring him happiness? And so it's being with Clara. Um, And I don't know, I just found it I found it really romantic and really sweet. Uh, And I would highly suggest people go back and check that one out because it had been a a long time since I had seen it. Yeah, I think, you know, for me personally, it's like I, I it three kind of gets discarded, not because it's bad, but just because it doesn't have the same vibe as the first two. But that doesn't mean it should be. It's just it's weird, especially because the films are connect like two and three are connected. Three picks right up where two leaves off. Yeah. They were filmed back to back, you know, like they're it's hard to sort of separate the two. Um but they're so different. And yet I, I think three works. I think it's, I, I don't think it's like a drop off, like a level of, you're not going from like Godfather two to Godfather three. That's <laughs> a drop off in quality. That is, that is rough. Yeah. Uh, Back to Future Part three is perfectly enjoyable for what it is. Yeah. Uh, well, and it, it, the thing that I think it brings a little bit of resolution to, and the thing that really stuck out like a sore thumb for me in part two is something that was really cartoony and unbelievable was the chicken thing. Like, oh, you called him chicken. That's, yeah, that's, that's rough. so weird. That's so weird that that's like his thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it so it comes back in part three as this payoff. So it's it's about Marty learning to uh, Marty essentially learning to steer his life in a better direction because you know being part three by the world's weakest insult. <laughs> well, that's the thing is that like is that that's the best they could come up with was that like oh what if he you know what if the thing that derails his life is someone called him chicken so he drag raced and he injured his hand and like everything went downhill after that. Um, like what could you know what would the thing what be if, that would make what him if race? You your fatal flaw. Yeah. So uh, I don't think I don't think it works super well in part two, but in part three, they bring I mean, clearly, again, they wrote part two and part three at the same time, shot at the same time. Um, So it was a setup and payoff thing. But I don't I think it sticks out like crazy in part two as just this like unbelievable like what? Because it happens like three times. And you're like, yeah, it's a a big thing. Yeah. Well, and also it's a big thing that has that never comes up in part one. 
No. Like, it's something they added. Like, in part one, he's not like, oh, don't insult Marty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't call him a chicken. Don't call him a Better chicken. not call him a chicken. Oh, he will lose his <laughs> shit. Um, so, yeah, that part never never set super well with me. Um, although I think I, I like the ending to part three a lot with the train uh, coming in with Doc and his family jewels and burn and everything. Um, I think that's very sweet. But I think they could have found a better way to to show that Marty was on a better path than like, Oh, someone called him chicken and he chose not to race. Yeah. Well, and again, that's sort of the difficulty of three is that three isn't really Marty's film. They switch, they go in the previous two films, Marty is the lead and doc is the supporting character and they flip it in part three. Yeah. So it's a, it's again, the dynamic feels weird. Which I think was smart because, you know, again, in part two, you start to feel a bit of the repetitiveness and like they couldn't have just done Marty doing it again in part three. And like, what does he meet like a damsel in distress in the old West or something like that? You know, that wouldn't track. The fact that they sort of were able to kind of keep it afloat long enough tells me is like one of the reasons why Bob Robert Zemeckis doesn't want to do a fourth film and he doesn't want to reboot this like he's like we we got it <laughs> we did <Yeah>. it it's fine <laughs> i mean as far like in terms of a sequel i don't really need a sequel like i get like people like oh what are jules and Vern up to and like what if they like to me it would be pure legacy sequel fodder that i that i don't need yeah. um it just you know i i just feel like you've you told the story and like it, you told the story on the character's terms in terms of like doc wants the time machine destroyed that's mm-hmm. his part, is learning that the time machine, the thing that he worked for his whole life, can't be trusted, and it creates more trouble. So even though he, he built it with good intentions, it's not safe. And the time machine gets destroyed at the end of part three. It's not like waiting. It's not the Ecto-1 waiting to be discovered by new kids. You know, like, it's destroyed. It's gone. Let it be gone. Yeah. Um, and so I feel like a sequel would just kind of undercut that. And then if you were trying to reboot it or remake the original, as we said, it's a weird movie. It's a very weird movie. And I feel like the only way you could do it, and I don't think you should do it, is like some sort of like Lord and Miller, we've come up with something so brilliant, like R-rated comedy that like Universal would never want to make. But like it's, you need something really drastic, like a really drastic out of left field idea. And even then, I don't think it would be worth it. I think like Back to the Future is a classic. Don't you don't need another Back to the Future. Like we have three great movies and that's it. And I get that everything is IP now, but just leave leave well enough alone for once in your <laughs> life. Like I love the fact that Back to the Future is kind of untouchable right now for the reasons that like Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale are like, yeah, we're not doing like we own we we are rights holders on this. And we are not signing off on any remake or reboot or sequel. It's not going to happen as long as we're alive. Yeah. Yeah. I said, I, I don't subscribe to the idea that like remakes, remakes or reboots hinder the original in any way. Like I could give a fuck. I don't care, but I agree with you. I don't think it's necessary. I think it, it could only be disappointing even if Lord and Miller tried to do it because you just know it would be like, you know, oh, like Marty's grandson has to travel back to 1985 and like, oh, it's going from the 2020s to the 80s. And now we're just going to like languish in the 1980s or maybe by the time they do it in the 90s, um, just for that sweet, sweet nostalgia. Um, and it would just caught like it would probably mimic a lot of the movements of the original films. And people would say, oh, I understand that reference. I also understand that reference. And something that one of the reasons I think Back to the Future works so well is kind of like a time travel is because like the 1955s had been captured on film and in television, but not in that full color kind of like this is what life is like in this imagined 1955 in which we live. Like the 1955 depicted in Back to the Future is one very informed more by like advertisements and like what popular culture was Mm -hmm. rather than like this is like again to go back to the racial issue like this is a 1955 where there's one black guy and yes he goes on to become mayor but there's one black guy like it's not like 1955 where we tell you about civil rights or anything like that it's a very much a white imagined 55 that's serving a particular purpose i mean like yeah biff is racist but he's racist towards irish people like it's just a weird thing yeah, uh, I I just don't. 
think it would work. And I think the only, like, as I said, I think the way that they would do it would just be a nostalgia play on the 90s or the 80s and then just start mimicking the plot beats from the other films just because, like, that's what they did. So therefore, you know, right. it should be fine. But yeah, I mean, I think Zemeck is lucked out in making three not terrible movies in a row. Um, and the two sequels were only came along, like, I think, like four years after four years the first back to the future. 90. So it's not super long after. And then they were done. Like, they, I mean, there was the animated series, I guess. But um, it's a franchise that, you know, that kind of staying power doesn't exist for a bunch of a bunch of other films um, and franchises. And, you know, Zemeckis has gone on to varying degrees of success with other things. I think I think he's a fascinating filmmaker in that he doesn't necessarily have an authorial signature other than ambition. Like he's like, you know, um, for Castaway, like, let's shoot half the movie when you're fat. Let's take 10 months off. I'll make another movie in between what lies beneath for the studio. We'll come back and shoot the rest of the movie. Um you know, Forrest Gump with that cutting edge digital technology to to insert Forrest Gump into scenes with a bunch of celebrities, um, whatever the fuck Allied was, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Sandstorm. down, but I will say, like, you know, well, as much as we as people can dunk on films like The Polar Express and Beowulf, like, what you have to understand is like Zemeckis was basically finding the path by walking. It. Yeah. Every and also and the fact that, like motion capture is now like ubiquitous in movie making today. But it's motion capture stuff that he was pioneering. Yeah. He was kind of on the wrong idea of like, oh, all films will be all motion capture now. And it didn't quite go that way. But the technology uh, that he was using has been refined by other films. So he was first out. He was one of the early people out of the gate with that stuff. And I, and, I, and to be fair, I think his films did get better the more he played with it. Like I think his version of A Christmas Carol is actually very well done. It's I actually really think good. it's really good. It was a really smart idea to have the ghost be played by the same actor as Scrooge. Like, I think that's a smart concept yeah. um, that you could only do with really with motion capture. So, I, I'm, you know, even though like even stuff like 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 Welcome to Marwin is just a fascinating <laughs> failure. I don't know if you saw it. It is <laughs> a it. weird movie. Just a very like, this is <laughs> this is a weird way to look at women. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but I mean, that's what Zemeckis does. He takes huge swings like death becomes her. I mean, Meryl Streep famously didn't necessarily enjoy that process because it was so heavily, heavily involved with prosthetics and makeup and pushing the boundary of prosthetics and makeup, um, which the back to the future sequels were as well. Apparently it was like a, a closely guarded secret of the heavy prosthetics they were using to um, make um, you know, Lorraine and, and everybody look older or kind of change their face and, and structure and everything like that. But Death Becomes Her is a super cutting edge film in terms of what it was doing with makeup effects at that time. Um, you know, cutting holes in Goldie Hawn and, and Meryl Streep. Um, and I, think I that, love that movie. And I also think that films like Death Becomes Her and like Forrest Gump, I also speak to who I think Zemeckis is, who is a, I think he's a very cynical person. I think he's kind of like a very, like he has a very withering look at a feeling about humanity. But, um, you know, there's still like, I don't like Forrest Gump, but Death Becomes Her is awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited to see what he does with Pinocchio. I think that'll be interesting because that's yeah. a story that, uh, I feel like he he he's not someone who's ignoring themes. He's not a I, I think what I'm trying to say is that like he's not your average journeyman. He no. his films do not necessarily carry a signature, but they are unmistakably his. Yeah. I I would agree with. You. Um yeah, even when he's doing something like The Walk, it's like I want to, you know, fool around with IMAX cameras in a way that they haven't been done before. Yeah, how do I literally make you feel like you're on top of this building even though the entire thing was shot on a blue screen? Right. So yeah, um, obviously the Back to the Future films are always great and people should watch them whenever they want. They're all on Netflix right now. Um, so let's move on to recently watched. What have you seen lately? Um, so my fiance and I started watching Normal People on Hulu, um, which is based on a book that she loved by Sally Rooney. It's this critically acclaimed book. It was on, uh, I think, Obama's list of his favorite books of that year. It's going to sound weird when I describe what it's about because it doesn't sound that interesting or good because um, ostensibly it's a love story about these two people who meet as teenagers um, and then it kind of follows them along. Um, but I mean, as the title suggests, it's about um, 
kind of the misnomer of normal people and how no one is necessarily normal. But I'm, I was really struck. I think the series is brilliant. It's directed entirely by Lenny Abramson, um, who directed Room and Frank and The Little Stranger, uh, which I liked quite a bit. Um, and it's very intimate. It's kind of like the OC by way of Blue is the Warmest Color, except like much more sensitive um there's a lot of sex in it there's a lot of sex scenes in it but they're all very respectfully done and the where lenny puts the camera is really emotionally involving um you feel like you're kind of inside these characters heads uh and i don't know it's just it, it's it's one of those things that's hard to just describe because it's basically just a story about humans but the way that it's told and the scripts, which uh, I'm told are are very close to, um, they have a lot of dialogue lifted straight from the book, um, are just very specific, um, which then kind of lends kind of a universality to to um, them. It's set in Ireland, um, and it's a cast of Irish actors, um, but. I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of blown away by the filmmaking of it. It's only 30 minute episodes. There's 12 of them. They're on Hulu right now. Um, it looks like it's kind of sad and, and it is kind of sad, but like in the way that like life is just generally kind of sad, like, you know, like not to say that like life is all sadness, but there is a sadness of life. There is a sadness of love lost. There is a sadness of bad feelings of being hurt, of being jealous, but there's also, you know, that sadness comes on the heels of joy and, um, uh, you know, feelings of pure warmth and love and intelligence um, and stuff like that. So I don't know. I highly recommend checking it out. I think it's a it's a series that's probably going to be picking up quite a few Emmys um, as that season rolls on. Um, but I was really blown away by it, um, especially if you're a fan of, of films like Blue is the Warmest Color or stuff like that. That's just very kind of like epically intimate. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah, I didn't really. I've been hearing about it, but I didn't really know what it was about, other than it was Irish. I'm like, oh, like Dairy Girls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is not as funny. Things? <laughs> there is humor in it, um, but yeah, no. But it starts in high school and then follows them into kind of college, and then I don't know if it goes further. We're only halfway through, but okay. uh, I'm liking it a lot, and I can understand like watching it. As I said, it's hard to describe, but like. If I a, like in reading this story, I would be very wrapped up in the story of these two characters. It's just a it's just a story of two humans. So it's cool. not like a big plot show. So um, cool uh, for me. Uh, I my wife and I, we tore through Parks and Rec in two weeks. <laughs> uh, we start so we finished watching The Office. And we're like, oh, what do we want to watch next? We'll watch Parks and Recreation. And we just, you know, it's seven seasons. It's all on Netflix right now. And I don't think we expected to watch it as fast. I mean, it was a rewatch for both of us. I don't think either of us expected it to go through it as fast as we did. But it just, it, it works so well. And it's really interesting watching, especially, and I wrote about this for the site, how much it transforms from season one to season two. I mean, all of us has that transformation as well. But as I said in my article, like that transformation in the office is really boiled down to the Michael Scott character and how he changes. And then they kind of bring, expand the cast a bit. They let, let you know about other people in the office. Whereas the way Parks and Rec changes is that everyone sort of, you, you take these negative people like Tom and April and you take the negative things and then you find instead you slant it to make them more positive. So Leslie, instead of becoming, instead of being a stupid person, is just a naive person. And like just these little tiny shifts make the characters feel like they're the same person, but the angle has changed so that it feels like a better show. And then the show just gets stronger with every season. And I think, well, I think, I think seasons three and four are the strongest seasons in the bunch. I, I mean, the show does not fall off a cliff. No. Um, it doesn't like I thought season seven is still like, very entertaining. Like it's still very well done. Um, we will have a, like, so they, they also recently aired the, the reunion kind of special. And for me, it was interesting because before that they aired this Paley, Paley center salutes parks and rec thing. And they talked about how West wing was an influence on parks and rec. And I was like, Oh, and then, so afterwards watching the, the, uh, the reunion episode, I'm like, this is their Isaac and Ishmael. This is the episode <laughs> where they take something in the real world that it's not really connected to anything in the show, but like they're reminding you of something that happened in the real world and the show is 
it makes the show feel weird. Like you like these characters, but it's weird listening to them talk to you about like things that are actually happening instead of their, like it's, it's, it's a little left of where it's supposed to be normally. Um, it wasn't like a bad episode. Like it's still nice to see those characters, but it was just, it was, it was an unusual kind of uh, framing given the, 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 the subject matter and then the way it was filmed. But I think Parks and Rec is just, it's a wonderful show and it has pushed uh, my wife and I to finally, finally watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Cause that mm. to me, like it's in that same wheelhouse, same creative forces. Um, even though I know not nine is what Dan Gore. Yeah. Yeah. So it was on. kind of like Greg Daniels ran the office and Mike Shore was his number two. They went and created Parks and Rec and Mike Shore was like the showrunner of Parks and Rec and Dan Gore was his number two. And then, Brooklyn Nine Nine, Mike Shore and Dan Gore created together, but Dan Gore ran Parks and Nine Nine. Right. Or books Brooklyn Nine Nine, not Parks right. and Nine. So yeah, we're about to move into Brooklyn Nine Nine, and I'm very excited. That show is. I was about to ask, what's your next thing? Um, that yeah. show is a ton of fun. My only criticism against it is that it's like it's no nowhere near as serialized as Parks and Rec or The Office, so it's much more of like feel good chunks. But there's not a ton of like overall story arcs that you get super invested in. So, okay, that's fair. That's good. But it's know. very funny and very fun. Yeah. And Phil Lord and Chris Miller directed the pilot. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. So yeah, that's what uh, I'm up to. So uh, we put out a poll before we started recording um, to see what y'all wanted us to talk about next. Adam, what is our winner? Let's see what the results are. I'm tabulating, tabulating by the skin of its teeth. Solo, a Star Wars story. <laughs> Lord and Miller. It's time we talked about a film that we don't uh, adore. Yeah, that's fair. I think that's fair to dig into it, especially I think now that we have sort of the dis- the benefit of time. You know, now that like two years have passed since the release of Solo, we can kind of talk about its impact and legacy. And you know, it's when not we talked movie. about it last time. We were like, I wonder what this means for this future yeah, spin off, right? <laughs> <laughs> dumb dumbs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely would. I, I think it's worth talking about, especially now that the sky, like how it relates to where Star Wars is right now and how the fandom is really has related to it and things of that nature. So that should be a fun one to talk about. But Hot Rod was number two again. So we will talk Hot Rod. <laughs> hot Rod in the mix until you sons of bitches select it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we put those these polls out on our personal Twitter accounts if you're wondering where they come from. So yeah. stay tuned to those. And usually, so we record these on Monday early afternoon. So look for them around Monday early afternoon is when we put the poll out. So. Yeah. So uh, if you want to go up with this podcast, you should follow us on Twitter. Adam, where can we find you on Twitter? At Adam Chitwood. And you can find me at Matt Goldberg. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll be back with you next week.